Hey everyone, welcome back to RPG Imaginings Milestone Video. 200 subscribers, thank you so much. I never expected the channel would get this far. I'm going to continue to do, do it so long as I enjoy it and so long as you're getting enjoyment out of it. When I started RPG Imaginings, my goal was to sort of focus on some of the RPGs out there that are a little bit more on the fringe, maybe not as well known, because those are the role-playing games that have sort of attracted me. But the good news is, is that a lot of these games that I love and that you love are getting a lot more press, so to speak, and people are becoming a lot more aware of them and so if there's anything that I can do on this channel to help to share the wide variety that exists within the role-playing hobby I'm absolutely willing to do that. So in celebration of 200 subscribers, what I want to do here is point out to you a couple resources that are available to you if you do Lovecraftian role-playing. And honestly, it doesn't matter which Lovecraftian game you are playing here. It doesn't matter whether you're playing Call of Cthulhu. It doesn't matter whether you're playing Trail of Cthulhu. It doesn't matter whether you're playing World War Cthulhu or... Uh, Cthulhu Dark or uh, any of the other Lovecraftian role-playing games that exist out there, if it is related to the Cthulhu mythos, either of these resources could help you, and each resource has its own strengths. And so I'm going to start on the left with S. Peterson's Field Guide to Lovecraftian Horrors, a field observer's handbook of preternatural entities and beings from beyond the wall of sleep. So let's move hideous creatures out of the way here temporarily. When I read Field Observer, I'm an ecologist by training. <laughs> That's where my particular area of expertise is for science. I'm a science teacher, and ecology is my area of expertise. And so when I read Field Observer's Handbook, I already have some expectations for this book. Now, for those of you who don't know, this book was released as part of the Kickstarter for Call of Cthulhu 7th Edition. I did not get on that, in on that. I purchased this book. Uh, at retail, it was thirty four ninety five. I thought that it would be a really good thing to show on the channel when we hit a milestone, and here we are. And so this book, when I think of Field Observer's Handbook, I'm thinking of like detailed pictures that will help us to recognize these things and some information about their ecology. Let's see what we get. Let's go ahead and open it up. And so... Table of contents, if you wanted to pause on the table of contents here. And you know, now that I'm going to single books, I think I'm just going to zoom in just a little bit. Well, I'm not really zooming, I'm, I'm altering the tripod. Uh, just so that people can get a, a little uh, closer picture of what's happening with uh, the, the whatever book we're, we're looking at. So we have picture of HP over here on the left, table of contents, and forward. Uh, some 20 plus years since they were first published, the Peterson Field Guides continue to provide preternaturalists and dreamers with a source of hard to find information regarding a range of terrestrial, extraterrestrial, extra dimensional, and dream inhabiting creatures. And you may be saying to yourself right now, hey, this doesn't really read like the forward to a role play playing supplement. This book is written in character, so to speak. And so you'll notice here it says Professor Westbury, Illinois Carter, the School of Medieval Metaphysics, Miskatonic University, 2015. I think that that adds a lot of flavor to the book. Now, the one thing that I will say about uh, Peterson's uh, field guide here is that the art is just some of the best that has been done for Call of Cthulhu. I'm going to alter the camera just a little bit so you can get it fully in frame and see what's going on here. So here we have a Yithian, a member of the great race of Yith. Beautiful art work. Let's just do some more turning of pages. This is this may be one of my favorite pieces of serpent person art that has ever been produced by anyone ever. It's just gorgeous. The art in this book is top notch. If I were to recommend this book to people, which I do, if you need it as a resource for pictures, this is the best resource for pictures that exists for Call of Cthulhu. The pictures are also, I would say, top-notch for any Lovecraftian game, so long as you can use the image for whatever it is that you're seeking out. So we have an introduction, once more in character. This is really interesting. Identifying monsters of the mythos. There's essentially a, uh, a dichotomous key. 
essentially. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a dichotomous key is, die means two, cotomous means choices. So a dichotomous key is where you go through a series of usually two choices step by step to sort of identify a beast. And this is totally in flavor for what the book is trying to do. If you're using this book to try to identify creatures, you would start here just asking the question whether you can see it or not. And depending upon your answer for the dichotomous key, it tells you where to go. This is totally something that biologists use, especially when they're trying to determine the morphology, the form of a particular animal, or whether they're trying to key out a skull for mammalogy. And so I think that this is a really cool uh, include, and I like the way that the arrows are drawn differently to sort of give the impression that, that uh, it was someone sketching notes in a sketchbook. Then it basically goes, the book is in two sections. It goes through some general Lovecraftian uh, outer gods, great old ones, and monsters. And then the second half of the book focuses on the dreamland. So I'm just going to do some flipping here so you can sort of see what's involved. Um, cool thing about this, uh, another cool thing about this is that uh, you basically have life history information on the left-hand side. I think some keepers and uh, game masters are going to be interested in this. Some aren't going to as much. It's going to really just depend upon, you know, what your your take is on this. There's an HPL or relevant quote for every entry, goes through habitat, disposition, interesting facts, what makes it different from other mythos monsters so that you don't confuse them. There's usually a comparative height chart here. And then there are one of my favorite things about this is that there will usually be some handwritten notes that whoever was writing this guide was jotting down some critical things that they thought was awesome about it. And so here we have a Bayaki, Chthonian, Dark Young, notice that this is a very different take on the Dark Young compared to uh, many other sources out there. I like the variation of this. I also really like that we have like the three-dimensional nature of the creature with this uh, this more shadowed back limb and the, and the back tentacles. And so uh, there's definitely some variation in the art compared to what a lot of people might be used to. This deep one, I think, is very different from what, uh, what many people have seen in prior artwork. And so the variation the art I think is very good as well. Dimensional Shambler. This looks very different from the 7th edition, for example, called Cthulhu Rulebook. And so anytime you have options, I think that's great. Because not everybody is going to run a Lovecraftian game in the exact same way. Look at this picture of an elder thing. That's just amazing. Okay, and so I'm not going to flip through every page here. I'm just trying to give you a taste. The ghast has been used in other Call of Cthulhu products, for example. Like this picture appears in, uh, in um, gosh, what's the supplement that I'm thinking of? Doors to Darkness. So this image uh, was repurposed in Doors to Darkness as well. But I would say a majority of these images have not been repurposed in other scenario packs. Now, of course, Nair Lathotep. Uh, appears uh, in the core guide and in Masks of Nyarlathotep. This is just another amazing picture of a certain serpent person. Serpent people are one of my one of my favorite mythos threats. But let's just ki I'm just going to flip through rather quickly here. You can sort of get a taste of what's contained within here. And I want to get to the second part of the book, which is Creatures of the Dreamlands. Now, I want to point out this section because for those of you who maybe Dreamlands isn't your thing, um, this section of the book isn't going to be as useful for you. But once again, it is just some generally amazing art and there's no reason why you couldn't repurpose this art and call it something that is a mythos threat in the quote unquote real world. And so whether you like the concept of Dreamland's creatures or not, uh, there's a section here. Uh, Cat from Saturn is probably an example of a Dreamland's creature that is very likely to appear in, it appears in a lot of scenarios for Call of Cthulhu and Trail of Cthulhu, and so something to consider. Um, I want to point out another one of my favorites here. Um, so I'm just going to flip forward really quickly. This depiction of, the, of a moon beast the coloration on it, the red and black, I think just contrasts really strongly and evokes like the nature of the creature. And then there's a reference to the Men of Lang section. Night Gaunt. And then probably my favorite one here is this depiction of a Zoog. Um, I hate bubbly, bubbly images 
bubbly biological images. It drives me nuts. And so in terms of like evoking an emotional response for me, this picture of a Zoog is amazing to me. So should I get S. Peterson's Field Guide to Lovecraftian Horrors? Well, here's what it's great for. If you just want some basic ecological information on creatures, if you are looking for, I'm prepared to say, the best art, full color art for... Uh, mythos creatures that is out there. I mean, there, there are other sources. Of, there's other great artwork out there. Don't get me wrong. But if you're looking to support Chaosium, um, this is, of course, an official product for Call of Cthulhu. I can't recommend this enough. And remember, this isn't just Call of Cthulhu. There are no stats in this book, by the way. This is not a stat book. This is what I would consider to be a visual and ecological companion. So there's one option for you to flesh out your Lovecraftian role-playing games. This is one that I just picked out, or picked up, I should say. This was released in 2018, near the end of 2018. Let me just show you how thick this book is. It's ridiculous, okay? This is Trail of Cthulhu, Hideous Creatures, a bestiary of the Cthulhu mythos. This is by far my favorite book that has been released for Trail of Cthulhu, hands down. So Kenneth Height, Gareth Ryder Hanrahan, Becky Anison, Helen Gould, and Ruth Tillman, you knocked this out of the park. And this is a useful reference not only for Trail of Cthulhu, but also for Call of Cthulhu or any other Lovecraftian game. I There are stats in this book. There's Trail of Cthulhu stats. But what I'm excited to share with you is that the stats are not the best part of this book. Okay, uh, The stats are there if you need them. Okay, but the best part of this book is the other decisions that these authors have made as to what aspect of these mythos threats to not only share and report on, but also to inspire. And that's the word that I want to emphasize for you. This is an inspiring book. It's a book that aims to inspire you as a keeper or game master. So keep that in mind as we're looking at the uh, uh, through these entries. Now, like all Trail of Cthulhu books, you get really high quality glossy paper, but it is black and white. So that's an example of a sacrifice that uh, the folks at Pelgrain made for Trail of Cthulhu that helps to keep the cost of the books down. This is a 370 page book for $50. It's a really good value, but one of the compromises is that the art in this book is great, but not as good as the art in S. Peterson's Field Guide to Lovecraftian Horrors. And that's okay, because this book is going to do other things for you. Now, you can see here from the table of contents, I mean, this is, there's a lot of stuff in this book, just like a lot of stuff in this book. So I'm going to turn to my favorite, Serpent Folk, page 233, and I want to show you how each of these entries in the book are organized, because this is just a brilliant resource for Call of Cthulhu, Trail of Cthulhu. I mean, obviously intended for Trail of Cthulhu, but um, this is a brilliant resource in terms of content. Uh, this is in no way, shape, or form my favorite Serpent Peep person artwork. In fact, I'll be honest with you, I kind of hate it. Okay, um, It's a little too Cobra-esque for my tastes. Um, I prefer either the dr draconic or more snake-like Ophidian artwork. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to poo-poo artwork when there could be no artwork. Um, so what's going on here? Okay. So in each entry of this book, you are going to get, it's going to start off with the basics about this particular creature or race or uh, whatever. Um, there are not outer gods in this book. Okay. This is focused almost exclusively on monsters. So that's something to keep in mind, okay? So um, every entry starts off with some basic, here's what you really need to know about this particular threat, which is usable in any system, okay? Gives you some uh, game statistics, and in this particular entry for Serpent Folk, they also have information about degenerate Serpent Folk, as well as the Children of the Night in their humanoid form. And so there's lots of different versions of these different... Uh, of these different creatures, whatever they are, that exist within each entry. Another thing that I want to point out here is that uh, there's a section here for possible serpent folk abilities. Part of horror role-playing 
is emphasizing the unknown. And one of the big problems with with our struggles that a lot of game masters have with role playing is that it's not always the right thing to play monsters according to the book. In fact, I would be prepared to argue that it is more right than not not to portray them as they are in the book. Because if your players already know what's happening in the books, then honestly, folks, we're just playing a video game with numbers. Okay? If you really want to inject a sense of mystery which is needed for a role-playing game, this book is doing what you need to do as a game master. It's suggesting different possible abilities for this creature to have. All sorts of abilities that the serpent folk could or could not have depending upon how you're going to run them. Next, there's going to be a variation section for each of these. And I just love this section because this section is all about, have you considered this difference of what god they might worship? Have you considered this different possibility of their life history, of how they div deal with their everyday lives? Have you considered that they have enslaved this type of monster instead of this? Are they extraterrestrial in origin instead of something related to uh, Earth? Is it um, confusion? Do people think that this is its own subset of monsters, but it's actually a variety of dinosaurs? How does this relate to Volusia or Lemuria or other classic uh, historical aspects of the mythos? Is this related to Stygia in Conan's time? Okay, there's all sorts of variations. And for the Serpent Folk sec section, this is not any different from any of the other sections. There's a listing of a solid 25 plus different variations as to how you might alter your game uh, according to, to what you see here in this book. Um, mythic echoes, where you might see uh, serpent people arising in different aspects of our different places in the world. The investigation section indicates how different skills might be used to find out information for uh, this particular race. So perforce, the clues in this section mostly point to conventional serpent folk as painted in Howard's stories. Feel free to the, adjust them at will. And so this example right here, archaeology, the great serpent mound in Ohio sits on top of a crypto explosion, a geological formation resembling a volcanic crater with no volcanism. If the stratigraphy is right, this explosion dates back to the Permian, Permian era. Could the mound builders have intended this not as an image of the great serpent, but as its gravestone? So it's just giving you how you might use different skills or what information different skills in a Lovecraftian game might reveal that could lead someone towards the serpent people as an example. And yes, there are Trail of Cthulhu stats in here, but these are things that are easily adapted to any Lovecraftian game. Okay, Then we always have a scenario seed section in which it details, uh, well, gives a moderate level of detail, I would say, of how you might kick off serpent people as part of a scenario or part of a game. Okay? And so there's a bibliography section. How does this relate to H.P. Lovecraft's writing? How does it relate to August Durlis' writing? Other writings that have happened since then. And then this is another favorite part of this supplement for me. At the end of every section, there is a handout, series of handouts in this case, that is specifically tailored towards pointing out, in this case, serpent people as particular throw, uh, foes. And so um, let's just go ahead and read through one of these, okay? Um, obituaries. Jean, uh, Jean Chesneau, 26, New York, born in Montagny-sur-Abao, France. I, I know I butchered butcher that. Uh, Flautus has been a resident of Greenwich Village. The city mourns the loss of talent so freshly marked. And so what each of these newspaper articles are detailing here is a series of clues that will lead investigators to serpent people being the culprit. And so now that I've given you an idea of the basics of how it works, let's just flip quickly through the Shoggoth section and sort of see how it's applied here. 
Okay. Um, too often keepers fall back on a big amoeba or a D&D style black pudding. Try modeling the Shoggoth with other base matter and different color s- schemes. Is it spongy, pouty, and uh, powdery and vomitous like slime molds? Does it have matted wet hair? All sorts of options here. Some game statistics for Trail of Cthulhu. Possible abilities for Shoggoths. Variations of Shagas, the Shagoth colony in the Dreamlands is a foul lake beneath the peaks of Throck. There, Nightgaunt spy on the puffed Shagoths for, no- for Nodens, ensuring their doubtful sleep continues. That's just one of several variations you could go off. Different places in the world where Shagoths might be involved, some investigations of how this might relate to different skills, some scenario seeds, a bibliography, just like the last section, and this time it looks like we have a letter. And you can, you know, pause the video if you like. I'm not going to read this letter, but this letter is going to point to Shoggoths as the culprit. And the letter continues on the next page. Some of these are really fleshed out handouts, and I just love it. And then we get to Spawn of Yogg-Sothoth. And so I am so excited, folks, to share these two resources with you. Either of these resources could be useful for you. It kind of just depends upon what you're looking for. If you are looking for visual display and a sort of uh, tongue-in-cheek in-universe um, uh, field guide to Lovecraftian horrors, go with S. Peterson's field guide to Lovecraftian horrors. If you are looking for ideas about how to switch up the various hideous creatures of the Cthulhu mythos, go with Trail of Cthulhu Hideous Creatures. This one very content-rich, this one very art-rich. They both do different things super well. And so, honestly, I'd recommend that you get both of them if you have the funds, okay? Um, I definitely don't regret either of these purchases. I was particularly surprised, though, with Trail of Cthulhu Hideous Creatures. Between this two, this one definitely wins out for me. It is my favorite product produced for Trail of Cthulhu by Kenneth Height at all. And so uh, thanks so much for watching. Thanks for subscribing. And if you're liking the things that you're seeing here, and if you'd like to see more videos about uh, other role-playing games that exist in the world, um, this would be the channel for you. Have a great day, everybody.